Hello and welcome to the Intentional Clinician Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Krauss, Licensed Professional Counselor. I'm so excited today to have Elaine Burchill on the show. She is a hoarding behavior and intervention specialist and the co-author of Conquer the Clutter, Strategies to Identify, Manage, and Overcome Hoarding. Elaine is a social worker by training, and she is joining me on the Intentional Clinician to help demystify and destigmatize hoarding. Elaine talks about many different elements on this interview, and I think you're going to love it. She discusses research, strategies, real-life cases, and tools to help clinicians assess where their clients may fall on the hoarding spectrum. There's something for everyone in this show. More than 19 million Americans hoard. Many more are impacted. Hoarding comes with enormous cost to relationships, time, focus, peace of mind, and self-respect. It devastates marriages, and it harms the emotional health of children involved. Hoarding can also become a legal, personal, and public health safety issue. Without hoarding-informed, supportive interventions, people who hoard will continue to experience further deterioration in their mental health and in their living conditions. Elaine Birchall is the director of Birchall Consulting and the founder of the Canadian National Hoarding Coalition. She specializes in helping individuals with hoarding disorder to understand and change their relationship to things and to clean up their environment. She trains mental health professionals across North America on how to treat folks who hoard and counsel family members who are impacted, among other things. Elaine has a wonderful amount of information on her webpage about all the other things she's involved in and the book we're going to discuss today. And now for the interview. All right. Welcome, Elaine Burchell, to the podcast. I'm so excited to have you here. I'm delighted to be here, Paul. Wonderful. So all the way from Ottawa, Canada, uh, on Zoom, here we are. And we're going to be discussing uh, the topic of hoarding and your new book, Conquer the Clutter, Strategies Mm -hmm. to Identify, Manage, and Overcome Hoarding. Uh, And I'm so excited because I don't know much about hoarding. And you are a hoarding expert. So I think this is going to be an interesting interview for everyone who's listening. Um, I have been reading over your materials, and I love how easy it is to understand it. But I would love for you to kind of talk about, just for the people that may not know too much about hoarding, um, what what is hoarding, essentially? Hoarding is a disorder as of May 2013 um, that can qualify. I guess one of the first important things to say about it is if it functionally impairs a person's life enough, significantly enough, um, it can qualify as a disorder and therefore it is eligible for consideration under human rights legislation for reasonable accommodation. All right. Um, So that's an important thing to know. Um, Hoarding, when it plays out, basically has three criteria that the definition in the DSM-5, the Diagnostic Manual of Mental Health Disorders version 5, is about three pages long, but it can reduce to about to three criteria. And the first is, and every hoarding situation has to tick each of these boxes, even to a minimal degree. So there must be what most people would describe as an excessive accumulation. And I say a failure to resolve. Now, we're not talking just discard, but to resolve the buildup, the excessive accumulation. Some or all of the living spaces can no longer be used for their intended purpose. You may still be carrying out those activities of daily living in your environment, but you're doing it through very unusual adaptations that are not conducive to a normal life, okay? So you might be cooking, but you might be cooking um, on the barbecue outside because the kitchen... um, is full. You can't access the stove. It's not safe. Uh, There might not be potable water. Um, You might be making food, um, sandwiches, that kind of thing, prep, but you're doing it in your lap uh, because all flat surfaces are highly um, 
covered by a buildup. The third criteria is someone is either actively distressed or distress, or there's conflict, all right? Or um, if they knew the true condition of the environment, they would have a legitimate reason to be concerned. That's important because that could be your landlord, your mortgage company, your home insurance company, the fire department, bylaw, property standards if you're living in a multi-unit dwelling, your neighbors who unwittingly, unknowingly um, are probably at more risk than you are given the buildup because they don't know enough to take precautions. They don't know the circumstances. So you don't have to cause the crisis, all right? Not every crisis is caused by the hoarded environment, but whatever happens that is untoward, unexpected, is going to affect the people who live in a hoarded environment far more, and it's going to place them and anybody living in close proximity at significantly higher risk. All right. So the other thing about hoarding is that basically uh, it's not all the same. It all looks the same on the floor. All right. And there's nothing that is inherent in hoarding that makes it squalid. All right. Or dirty or even disorganized. I have many people who are scrupulously clean as far as they can reach the, the areas. And they are very, very, very organized. Um, so that prejudice, that stigma, like you see in the TV shows, Paul, that is yeah. not the only face of hoarding. All right. And the people who end up creating these situations do it because they are in a chronic, usually by the time a buildup gets enough to worry about, um, really significant state of being overwhelmed, where that part of the brain that we count on um, to make decisions, it's like walking through mud up to your hips. They just cannot think strategically enough using um, the executive function part of the brain because of the state of being overwhelmed. And then there's a lot of other secondary losses. Um, and it's not all the same. There are different types of hoarding. Well, I'm glad that you are defining that and immediately at the beginning. And I was going to ask about the DSM and it being mm -hmm. a disorder because I think there is a stigma and a shame around a lot of mental illnesses that it's being shattered. However, one big one that I've not heard being shattered is uh, 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 hoarding for sure, because there are, sh there are TV shows, what we call quote unquote reality television. Although I've worked in television, so I don't call that reality television because I understand that editing television process. Is what it is. Yeah. Right. So uh, there are shows about hoarding and whatnot, where they try to do these giant interventions and change people's life and, uh, two ep and in like an episode. Um, but that may not be therapeutic or useful. Um, but it may, you know, uh, it, it might be a good for gawking at and, uh, having an emotional ride to have some popcorn with, but also I think it does give a, a bad stereotype to hoarding as sort of like, Oh, gross, you know, versus, wow, this is somebody who's really suffering and having a really difficult time in life, and this is a symptom of something deeper. The hoarding is an entire set of disorder, but it's also a symptom of maybe a deeper emotional unrest and and trauma or other or other problems in their life. And then also that all hoarding is not the same. Um, like you said in your in your materials, adaptive hoarding, which is when somebody like really takes advantage of a good deal going on and they stock up um, and try to keep it all organized, but it just starts to become overwhelming because of the amount of materials they're uh, kind of getting. Is that what I'm the hearing? The thing about adaptive hoarding, so there's adaptive hoarding and there's maladaptive hoarding, all right? Adaptive hoarding is what you're talking about. You might buy in bulk, you might um, hold on to things and you might organize them or you know where they are. Um, and, but the difference between adaptive hoarding and maladaptive is nothing ever goes past its expiry date, all right? You use the things. 
You don't you don't buy something when it's on sale, leave it in the freezer, and it's there four years later. All right. You don't lose track of it because it's the safe, the feeling of safety that when you over acquire, like somehow you're ready um, against what, you know, whatever prevails, the COVID, whatever. All right. Um, it You use it. You have a respect for it. It is a good practice if that's the way you do it. Maladaptive hoarding can look like the same thing, but generally um, it is not uh, used all of it, the purchase is not used within its defined space or even a little more leeway. You know, there's a whole gray zone around expiry dates and best before dates. Um, and, you know, I think science has proven that that to some extent is true, but it's not black and white. It's not five years later that tin of soup is still good or that shelf of soup is still good. Um, you lose track of it and it doesn't get used. It's more for your emotional safety that you overbuy or, or that you are highly triggered by something um, and you over acquire it. And if nothing says you buy it, um, some people end up, um, you know, doing the buy for nothing where we we trade, but uh, we trade on spec. We there is no exchange of funds. You know, these online groups, so they 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 go and they see something that's a really good deal, um, or it's free, and they grab every opportunity that looks like a good thing to do um, with no plan and no space. Mm. And then they create, they bring it home and they don't get to the next stage of how does this fit in my life today moving forward? All right. And, and then they create situations where they can't walk forward. Um, yeah, so I, I like this is a, pulling me in two directions. One direction is sort of the science and understanding that hoarding seems to be more on a spectrum, uh, just like other mental health uh, disorders and issues from kind of like clutter to, you know, go ahead. So if it meets the three criteria, even to the minimalist, by min minimalist degree, um, you have a hoarding situation. And it's less useful to call someone a hoarder. I really don't believe in labels um, because this is not your identity. This is a situation that you've created generally because of other feeders, all right? We don't actually even know for sure what causes that tipping point. However, the difference um, with hoarding is that it only heads one way if you don't identify what it truly is for you and you don't get the help you need. The only difference is the le is the lifespan. So you may have people who don't overly acquire a lot, but somewhere on the continuum of acquire, save, discard, or resolve, if it's not a discard, they create a bottleneck. And so if you don't overly acquire, Maybe once you have it, you feel a compelling need to hold on to it and save it. All right. You didn't get your money's worth. It still owes you. Um, it's somehow if you keep the thing, it's like the money goes back in the bank. Um, it doesn't. Once it's gone, it's gone. Or maybe you don't hold on to it. Maybe you just can't resolve it. Maybe you're so overwhelmed that you just don't have the capacity on as regular a basis as you need to, to make the decisions, making decisions about your things, because anything that stays in our environment long enough and in enough abundance to cause a problem, Paul, we have a relationship with our things, all right? We have a relationship if it's still there. And then deciding um, about what to do, where do I start? Um, becomes confounding, which is why I wrote this book. And services, services that truly understand hoarding and have compassion and respect 
for the people who create a hoarded environment are like hen's teeth. And so I wanted that book to stand as a legacy of 19 years work, but it contains the wisdom, the experience, and the feedback, the experience of people who've actually lived it and who were kind and and brave enough to teach me what worked and what didn't work for them and how individual the path into a hoarded environment can be and how much the person helping you along out of that path, back out of that situation, needs to understand and respect your path because that's the path you need to walk out. It's not cleaning up. It is not about cleaning up. It's about helping people understand and develop healthier, more appropriate relationships with their things today as they were today, not as they used to be, not as you wish they could be and hope someday they will be. Oh, I like that. Um, I'm really glad you wrote that book because I do think that uh, the people that are suffering from having a hoarding environment need somebody to speak up and empower them because like, I think uh, I haven't, I honestly have seen one episode of one of these shows that sort of does the stereotype. I'm bringing it up again, but it seemed like the emphasis was on cleaning and getting rid of the stuff. And that was all the drama. And then right at the end, right at the end, they said, and this poor woman had witnessed her husband be murdered in this house 50 years before. And I was like, wait a minute. I feel like that's what the episode should be about. The fact that this woman suffered this trauma and then she started putting stuff in that hallway and started accumulating outward And, and then, you know, going deeper, it is a relation, everyone's different. And so it's a relationship with the stuff. And I think that we can all, all the listeners out there, have you ever had a a possession or an item that you really felt a strong pull to? And I guess, imagine if you had 5,000 items that you had that same pull to, what would you do? And then I think that's start, that's part of the overwhelm. I know that I think people, um, you know, there's been an emphasis in my age group on this minimalism idea um, that we all have too much stuff and maybe we should be cutting down how many items we have in our house and maybe we should be reading ebooks and maybe we should only have three pairs of pants and, you know, this sort of thing uh, is, is getting popularized. But I think it's very emotional for people to become, to start, you know, becoming a minimalist. It's like a big commitment. So just imagine if you don't have uh, the disorder uh, of, uh, of having a hoarding environment, it, it, imagine how much more difficult it might be for somebody who has a disorder who cannot, you know, there's lo- all these criteria, but, you know, having difficulty making a decision, where do I start? What do I do? And then what if this stuff is uh, a self-soothing mechanism? What if it's uh, helpful to me? You know, and that I think is taking it to a more critical thinking and holistic mindset because uh, one thing that stunned me was that there are up to 6% of the population hoards. Absolutely. Oh, that's conservative, Paul. I can't go anywhere. I can't go to an airport. I can't go to a, well, I'm not going to restaurants these days, but um, I can't go anywhere and mention the word hoarding that I swear um, the person either self-discloses, somebody self-discloses, they have a relative, they have a parent, they have um, a family member, they have a neighbor, they know somebody, all right? It is far higher. We we haven't done, we haven't plumbed the depths of how uh, prevalent this disorder is. And the other thing too is, it's also a misguided belief that individuals who create a hoarded environment don't have, they're, they're not all defeated, defective people. Okay, they're not even mostly. Many people, I have had judges, I've had doctors, I've had practicing psychiatrists, I've had lawyers. Have I mentioned lawyers? Have I mentioned lawyers? Have I mentioned nurses, teachers? Okay, people with successful lives who outside of this environment lead successful lives. All right, and, but, 
the relationship with their environment, the relationship sometimes with themselves, and how much they attend to the balance of their mental health and their physical health uh, gets out of whack. And then that costs them. That costs them. Yes. And I, so I, I'm glad that you're bringing up that and that, and when uh, the, the diversity of it all, and that it's, there is a stereotype of a defeated despairing person when this is not the case. Uh, Upton, we think 19 million Americans or more. And I think there's two things I want to jump into the research, but something I just anecdotally have noticed as I've grown older is that the self storage facility industry is booming. And I actually knew someone that worked in the industry and they are expanding. They are, uh, you know, making, they're buying new warehouses for people to store stuff that they can't even store at their own homes. And I know some people like live in two places and that's some of it, or it's temporary or whatever, you know, but there's a lot of people that just have a dedicated storage space for stuff that they may not even see. You know, more than a lot once of a year. People live the minimalist life of storage spaces. That's how they maintain it. Let's not get ourselves okay. Um, but so we have we have a phenomena right now that will continue for a while, and we have the sandwich generation, where um, people are inheriting things or they've been left things, and when they're in a state of acute grief or they have their own things, and then they have children who are in university or who are coming up who will be setting up home, and the sandwich generation gets stuck between both of those polar opposite life points, and they want to pass on the history. They want to pass on the gently used items for the benefit of their children who are setting up home often with huge student debt, um, having to hold down two and three jobs to pay bills. Um, you know, the new marriages, new families, limited income, uncertain employment, um, in, you know, in the States, for instance, having to pay like huge amounts for, for your health care. Uh, your your healthcare plans, um, that's that's a significant chunk out of disposable income that you need when prices go up or things go on sale or or buying furniture that can be hand me downs. Um, but it's the it's the generation in the middle who has their basements full who who pays for those storage units so that their kids don't have to buy the stuff. Um, there, you know, and, and then you're looking at seniors, for instance, who downsize, and maybe it's for a temporary period of time, but then maybe a health issue kicks in, or there's a loss of some kind, and they don't have the energy um, to go back and make those decisions, and it lasts longer than they ever intended. But it, it leaves them in environments, sometimes also as a hoarding specialist, um, and, and I'm a therapist as well. Sometimes I will advocate for a harm reduction approach where rather than you're overwhelmed, all right, that's how the situation occurred. Let's overwhelm you a little more and make a whole lot of decisions that you're going to regret and then you're going to have to live with. And sometimes a harm reduction approach of using storage for a temporary period of time, hopefully no more than six months, all right? allows you to set up home in a safe way to get the relief and then to choose from the storage what fits in your environment and what are what I call the one, two, threes. Those are the jewels, the things that you, they're, they're emotional and, and historical touchstones for you and you want them near you. They give you, they have meaning. Yes, I think that is a wonderful way of looking at it because I think that we've all, most people have been in a situation where they were, somebody said, you know, especially as a kid, you have to give up your blanket. You know, you're <laughs> old, you're too old now for that blanket. And the okay. child throws this enormous fit because there's an attachment to this. Uh -huh. And I've, I've met people that I don't identify as having a hoarding disability, but have told me 
I hang on to things from my childhood because those things made me feel safe. And my parents and I had a very difficult upbringing and I didn't, I felt more safe with my teddy bear than I felt with my parents. And so I still have my teddy bear and, and I'm a grown person in my forties or fifties. And I feel that I need that teddy bear in my house somewhere, usually sometimes in the basement, if they have a basement. Um, and, and so I think I like how you're, how you're drawing the picture. So, and then, and then hoarding can become very serious. So I want to talk a little bit about some of these ideas about the environmental genetic or mental and physical vulnerabilities that increase the likelihood um, I, in your materials, you were writing about some hoarders share common markers on four chromosomes. A Johns right. Hopkins study linked compulsive hoarding to chromosome 14. And then in a study of hoarders with obsessive compulsive disorder, 84% had a first degree relative who hoarded. And of course, there's some abnormality according to one study uh, of low activity in the anterior cingulate cortex, which governs thinking and emotion. There can Um, be. uh, So it it sounds like it can affect, there's many factors. It's not just one that can lead to having this environment. Like you were talking about the diversity of experience of how people get into it. Um, and then, you, and then also you wrote people with certain psychological disorders ranging from ADHD and obsessive compulsive disorder to a, addictive personality disorder to depression, anxiety, and or with high social isolation, so, excuse me, social isolation and aging with mobility issues have a higher risk of hoarding. So can you talk a little bit about some of the kind of like science side of, of these uh, vulnerabilities, environmental, physical, and genetic? Those are the paths. Those are what I, in the book, describe as the three pathways. The first is genetics. We do know that in particular, um, it's been identified on chromosome 14, that there can be markers in common quite often, um, where there's a familial pattern of OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, or somewhere on that continuum, obsessive compulsive disorder behaviors or attitudes and beliefs. Um, We know that there also is an autosomal recessive inheritance pattern um, on um, chromosomes 4, 5, and 17. Um, We know that um, just think about growing up in an environment You can't hit the target if you don't know what the target looks like. And if the target was excessive accumulation for whatever reason, then think of the power of modeling behavior, all right? Sometimes the family values, the family stories, um, the family rules were about teaching your child to be a sentimental acquirer and saver and keeper. Um, Sometimes we're taught thou shalt not waste, but you know, nobody said anything about now it's up to your waste. Um, And you don't have the ability. You don't have the space. You don't have the skill. You don't have the time. You don't have the mental health. You don't have the physical health to deal with the other side of, okay, what's the alternative to thou shalt not waste? Does it mean you, thou shalt, thou must keep? Um, where's that space in between? Nobody taught you those skills. Um, you're talking to about the, um, the second path, and that is having a high-risk comorbid factor. And that can be things like OCD, uh, obsessive personality compulsive personality disorder it can be but it can be depression and anxiety to some extent as well half the western world um, is depressed and anxious all right look at the lifestyle look at the look at the feeders and the pressures stop blaming yourself stop looking for pathology um Whatever your balance is, it doesn't matter if it's OCD, it doesn't matter if it's depression or anxiety. If you have it, you have it for good reason. Look at the number of people, um, even in Canada, where we have a pretty vibrant healthcare system, and yes, there are lineups, but every single person has the right to be in the lineup, and your number's coming up sooner or later, all right? And if you're if you have an emergency, you can be put to the top of the line. The number of adults that have undiagnosed disruptive comorbidities like adult ADHD, adult ADD, um, social anxiety, um, 
there's a host of them. Addiction. Look at the look at the addiction levels now. Um, there's a compilation of pressures that results in that constellation of truths for you. Know it, own it, and get help with it. They do not define you. All right. If they're limiting you right now, they don't have to limit you. There is help and treatment available, and some of it's free. I have a free podcast every Wednesday morning on Zoom. All I ask is that you email me. Um, I make sure you are who you are, and we will send you the coordinates to join in. And it's like a big classroom. I think I had 75, uh, 80 people uh, last Wednesday. Um, So it's free of charge. Um, So help is available. Uh, The books in the library, that book was written to be your own self-coach. When there aren't services in your area, appropriate services, and you'll know them in pretty short order once you try them. And also, even if there are services, you can't afford them. All right. There's still hope. There's still a way. I love that you're talking about that because I think that um, my approach, I'm in I'm very much into trauma informed therapies and we see we we only use these DSM labels to identify what's going on for the practitioner. They are not a narrative or an identity um or I'm a bipolar, I'm a hoarder. It's it's about what's going on and and you know what that's just the symptom. The symptom is actually a signal and the signal is something's going on that is not going well in my life or something went on that is not going well i don't feel good you know for instance depression i won't even go into that but depression is multifaceted it's psychological it's physical it's yep. emo- it's spiritual it's chemical it's all of it. it's biological so so i mean there's never one thing so you know I think it's good for people to have podcasts and books and, um, and you know, th- there is help available for almost anything you're looking into. And I'm, you know, in, in your case, you are, you know, champion, championing people that are having this difficulty to be able to overcome it. Or and, they're too ashamed to come forward. Right. So I'm glad you put all these resources out here. I do think that I really liked what you talked about. I talk about this a lot, which is if we looked at ourselves from the third person and we drew a picture and we looked at all of like bubbles around us, all the stressors going on in the world, and especially right now with the coronavirus going on and people having to be in various levels of quarantine, isolation affects our mental health. And um, fear, anxiety about getting the virus. And then in the U.S., if you've you know tuned in from Canada, I'm sure that you've you've seen that there's been a, a giant uh, a, amount of social unrest and actually revelation about how uh, members of the African American community and Black people were being treated here. So that's a whole other thing. Systemically that are, disadvantaged and right. marginalized. Yeah. Right, and so that's a whole other thing people are thinking about. Even uh, you know, as I said, it's a pervasive conversation here, which is actually great because it will probably work on solving some of these issues in the long term. But in the short term, it's a stressor um, for people that are going through it, and it's a stressor for people that are trying to figure out how they can help and what to do about it. Mix that with coronavirus. Mix that with in the U.S. an election year. Mix that <laughs> with <laughs> yeah, that's a whole other thing. Mix that with um, you know, just what you talked about the economics of it. And in the U.S. here, you know, I'm in a good position because my most of my friends are doctors. I'm a therapist. My other friends are therapists or doctors or whoever. So if I'm in trouble, I I go to my own people. But what I'm saying is, if I'm in if I'm in trouble and I don't go to my own practitioner, that's not my friend. I can go to my friends and say, oh my gosh, what's going on with me? And they'll like, look at me, you know, most people do not have that bubble. Okay. And so, you know, and then the cost of healthcare, like that brings my cost down. Most people here pay for healthcare. And then, you know, I don't know many therapists that are hoarding experts. So it's almost like, um, or they think it's about 
Yeah, they think it's about the OCD. They think it's about the ADD. And if we can just get that right terrain, then it's going to solve. Then, you, then you'll go in and you'll clean up because they think it's about cleaning up. It is not about cleaning up. It's about helping that person change their relationship to the things. And I love what you said about all of these symptoms and things not being part of your identity. They are just factors. Everybody in life, the Queen of England included, all right, has something to deal with. This is your perfume uh, formula, all right? Know it, accept it, deal with it. And also, these factors are not insurmountable, all right? They're only insurmountable if you let them defeat you because they are robbing you of the life you were meant to have and that you're capable of having. And that's not just a bumper sticker, all right? That's the truth. And you're right, it, is, it can be complicated. But even if you don't have friends who are social workers, therapists, da 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 da, da you have people who genuinely love you and care about you, all right? Somebody does. And everybody, even if it's not somebody who's still with you, you have the learning and the lessons from that relationship of what would grandma have said to me? What would Nana have said in this situation? Those learning, that learning, that looking into somebody's eyes who loves you and respects you and accepts you, even though they may not approve of you in the moment, all right, who would tell you the truth because they love you and value you. Those never go away, even if the people have to leave. And that's what you draw on. In the book, I talk about, you know, even social workers can have a life that hits the, 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 the skids just as like, life deals you stuff, people. Okay, you're not unique. There's nothing broken or flawed or wrong with you. It happens. And I remember a time in my life when, you know, I Oh, the thought the morning came was I wasn't depressed. It was just, it was a situation and, and loss that had just overwhelmed me. And I remember getting up and thinking, oh, Lord, send me something. And then I thought, who, who would I trust? And the first person, there were a number of people, but the first person who came to my mind was my father, who was like a beacon to me. And I would stand in front of the bathroom mirror and say, I'm Ken Birchall's daughter and I can do this. I'm Ken Birchall's daughter and I can do this. He was long gone, but I was still drawing on the strength of that validating relationship. Find those people, even if it's in your memory banks, and draw on that because that's who you are. Not the overwhelmed person who's not quite cutting it right now. I, yes, I could not agree more. I could not agree more there. Uh, even if it's in your memory banks, um, we've got it, and it, it also comes into having compassion for ourselves. You're going through a hard time. You're not a blank. You are a person going through a suffering experience and we all suffer. And that's another thing, you know, uh, you're an expert, but you just did what I love the experts do, which is like, you know, I go through hard times as well. And we've all gone through this and you did this to serve people. You put this book out here to serve people. And, and just because us therapists don't, uh, we know a lot about quote unquote mental illnesses or disturbances or trauma. I like to call, I think everything originates in trauma of problems in the life. And then that becomes something else. Right. But, um, just because we know about it doesn't mean we aren't going through it too. Oh no. So, so we, we need to make our, sure we get a dish of it. <laughs> we all, everyone gets their turn as my mentor oh, yeah. says. Oh yeah. More than so, one sometimes. Yeah. Well, several turns sometimes. And so it's not a personal failing. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, it's, it's the human condition. All right. So, and, and I, yes. Yeah, so I, I, I always want to encourage people out there, you know, it, sometimes you go to a therapist, they don't know about hoarding or they don't know how to identify with you. It's not that you're, there's something wrong with you. It's just, you might've found the wrong therapist and not all therapists are created equal and we all have blind spots. So find someone who can, who can work with you. And that's, I think a good first step, especially if you're dealing with uh, a hoarding situation or clutter is actually, and we'll, I'll put all this in the show notes, but check out Elaine's book, check out her website, tons of free resources for people. 
Um, and, and then we can, you can really start on a journey. And that's, I think another thing uh, is that you said, it's not about the cleanup. I think one thing is if, if I was suffering from hoarding and all of a sudden I'm thinking about, oh, the solution, you know, the, the, the common day stereotype solution is clean the house, bring in a company, throw it out, throw, you know, it out. Rep, yeah. throw out everything, right? Get rid of it. You'll feel better. And maybe some of your friends or family have said this to you. That is not what Elaine is talking about at all. And it's a process. It's a process and it's a journey. And an important part of it is actually keeping stuff that makes you have, has value to you. Find the jewels, the things that mean the most to you. Don't come at it from, uh, uh, I got to give it up, a loss point of view. Come at it from, where are the things that mean the absolute most to me? And in the book, I help you develop Use the other side of the brain, not the emotional side of the brain. Use the other side of the brain. Add both together. And I developed a system of scaling that respects who you are as an individual, what's important to you, and what you, when you see it, you will know it. The problem is if you don't set what those criteria are before you start to deconstruct the piles, you'll be triggered by everything. You'll be distracted and overwhelmed. So when you set those criteria that reflect who you are, those are the meaningful aspects of the things that mean the most to you, you will recognize them because they'll fit those criteria. All right. And then it will be easy and you'll know the energy when you see it. You'll go, there you are. Oh, if something's got to go because there's too much stuff, it's not going to be you. It's going to be something else. All right. Because you have that relationship. And I love what you said, uh, Paul, because if you can really you can put someone into a psychotic break by taking their stuff. Okay, you can do that. And I have seen that happen to people who have come to me after because I like to say this is a little bit maybe too visual, but I like to say that when I go in and I see how much stuff there is, the first thing I tell myself is this is how much it takes to fill the void or the hole that this period person is experiencing in their life. And you don't start just pell-mell advising them on cleaning up because what are they going to use instead to support themselves? And it doesn't have to take a long time. What you do have to do is you have to get a little bit organized and supported in your mind so that you know who you are and what's important to you and you respect and you live by that. And then you need to develop three goals. And the three goals are, first of all, every single day, look for the joy, as small as it is, the joy, fun, and play. Those are the things that will give you energy. Then you look for what do I want to know more about? What do I want to be better about? I don't care if you live on the street. All right. Every person, if you're still drawing breath, is a living, growing, developing human being. What is it that you can use to remind yourself that you are capable of growth and change that's meaningful to you? And then the third thing is boring old work, because we all have to do things. And some, I, I don't think I, I make a joke in my podcast about I don't know anybody. I'm certainly not related to anybody. And I probably wouldn't like anybody who jumps out of bed in the morning and says, gee, I can hardly wait to do the thing I least like to do. <laughs> uh, that looks endless. Boy, oh boy, I, I would worry about that person's mental health. Um, and so, but that's a fact of life. We all have to do that. But in equal proportions, the balance is like a teeter totter. All right. Boring old hard work is over here on the right. Joy, fun, and play is over here on the left. And in the middle is growing, learning, developing human beings. So you need to keep your efforts and your focus and priorities in some better balance to start. I like that because I think that you're talking about the core of the person. And, and 
and the uh, the hoarding again is just a symptom of what's going on um, inside. And so, if we help that person with all the three things you just said, and and other parts of therapy, and other things, and other supports that they can get, then naturally it's going to become easier to deal with the hard work of deciding what to keep and what to go and how to how to get help with that. So and I, I love that because I think that the other way, I think when people are coming in from the outside and they, and they don't have that compassion or knowledge about hoarding, they focus on the stuff as we've as we've discussed. So I, I was curious about uh, I, I think that's great because I feel like you're laying out some practical things people can do. Um, I, I wanted to bring up a couple of pop psychology things before getting to to maybe like another idea i I have three questions so one of the things i'm going to bring up later is like what can family members do but i'm going to get the first two things i want to bring up is just get your comments on a couple things so in the u.s there is a trend of these of a people that call themselves preppers and what they do is they buy various things like canned goods water um well, with coronavirus, toilet paper, although that didn't fit in the thing. And this has been going on for years. Uh, they fear some sort of societal breakdown. They're buying all these supplies, uh, weapons, places to stay, oxygen tanks. Um, what, what do you, and I, I feel my theory is that it's about a sense of safety. And if I have these things in my house, even if they're almost useless in an actual apocalyptic situation, I feel safer about one happening. Uh-huh. What are your thoughts about that? Well, I fear, I, I believe uh, your description screams fear response. And I, um, I believe that we, um, our first reaction should never be to go to fear, go to fact. Remind yourself, you know what? You're not alone in this universe. Um, an example of that was I don't hoard and we did run out of toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> And so I thought, oh, this is kind of an irony. Um, and but the un- these these individuals, if they're if they're really really stuck with this belief, just possibly open your mind to the possibility that there's some merit. You don't have to believe it, but you are not alone, and you have a network. That network has a network. If you have Take it, if you have given as much or more than you've taken um, in your relationships, somebody's going to help you. Evidence of that was I was having some, um, this is just random, I was having some work done on a bathroom um, just before the virus hit. And just around the time that the toilet paper ran out and was running out, um, One of the workers uh, was coming in and we were all masked and gowned and whatever. And um, I said, you don't know um, of anywhere uh, that they have toilet paper, do you? And he said, no. I thought, okay, well, we're sunk. Um, Where's the Kleenex? Where's the whatever we'll start using? And he arrived the next day and he said, I had to pick up a part at, and I won't mention the store. Um, And he said, you know what? They were just loading the shelves. And he said, uh, because he arrives early, he's a workman, he's in there 7:30, 8 o'clock. And he said, So I got you 48. We were only allowed one package. You're not alone in the universe. You are not alone in the universe. All right. Go from fact. Go from fact, not fear. Because you're on the defensive when you go to fear. And defensive. Nobody ever won a game by only playing defense. Okay, you're going to be okay. Use your relationships. Be sure that you invest in them, that you give more than that you take from your relationships. And you will not be alone in the universe having to worry about whether the water went bad, whether the food is still dated, and actually it'll kill you more than it will save you. Um, And somebody will even buy you 48 rolls of toilet paper. That is so wise. I believe I'm talking to a very wise person and I'm just uh, that, you know, it's, it's very obvious. And I'm glad that you, that you went there and talked about your personal experience. And I remember because I was in Arizona for some work where I am a lot in the winter 
And because of coronavirus, I was basically trapped in Arizona for two months. Not not trapped. It wasn't like a bad trap. Like I have yeah. a place to yeah. stay there, but yeah. I wasn't around my my main house. And in my main house, in, in my house, I have usually I buy two things of toilet paper at a time and just have mm-hmm. them on backup because I don't, you know, I yeah. forget to go to the store or all that. Yeah. Well, in Arizona, time. in Arizona, I had a very low supply because oh, it's a small place that I stay at, and and so uh, you know we were worrying about it or whatever. And, and you're right. Fear makes us not want to reach out. But I said, you know, I said, what the heck? So I just text all my friends. I'm like, who's got some. And my one friend, he goes, you know, it's really weird before this. I, I always just, I always just have like a hundred rolls at my house. He's like, it's something about feeling like I, I, he's like, I like having amenities. And so he's like, I've got you for a year, you know? And he's like, but it's like, he only had, it, it, he, he was basically saying, and he kind of was joking. He's like, I just have a large supply of toilet paper, Epsom salt, uh, paper towel, and I can't remember something else. But he's just like, I always just randomly, he's like, for some reason, I just thought to have that. Yeah. And, okay. it, and, and if you went to his place, they, he had nothing else in li- a large supply, you know? Yeah. So yeah. eventually, I mean, I think I lent Dude him some in the things. eye of the beholder. Right. So, <laughs> you know, it works out if you, if you reach out. So I think that's important that people reach out. And I think the longer we stay isolated, the more fear takes over our minds. And then we're not in reality. And when we're not in reality, strange things can happen. Uh, so it's important to, then we've only got our own fear, like to run like a rat on a wheel. But uh, the one thing I think that's key to that though, Paul might be that you probably invested in that relationship. You probably gave even slightly more than you took on a regular basis from that relationship. And so if we all approach the people who are a closest to us and mean the most, and then any others just invest slightly more or more as much as you can in a relationship by helping when they need help, then you will never be alone. Okay. You don't have to be a do-gooder. You don't have to be a saint. You don't have to be anything. It's just be aware of everybody's boundaries and limits and treat each other with respect and, you know, and, and be, be that helper when you can. What if you if you are a person who gives, you will receive back. I mean, that's a parable of the universe, but it's so true. Um, so I it's true. I mean, I, I had helped that friend out a lot and they helped me out. So I was okay. Um, one more pop psychology question before I get to the family question, which I think is a big question. But this Marie Kondo has a very popular show about decluttering, and I think a lot of converts to decluttering, and I have to say. So this is just sort of personal. My wife was like, listen, this Marie Kondo, I think you need to get rid of some shirts or whatever. Some of my clothes that I had, like maybe not worn in a while, they were just in my closet because I started dressing differently for my job and was wearing different types of shirts. Uh And I was like, I felt threatened. I said, wait a minute. What if I need those shirts? What if I, (laughs) what if I have to go dress up for something? She's like, yeah, but you haven't been having to dress up for stuff. I'm like, what if I have to? So it was like this whole thing. I was like, Marie Kondo, stay away. I don't want to watch your show. So, (laughs) so can you talk about this like decluttering, like she's kind of made it hip to declutter your house and have less, but you know, tell, talk a little bit about that. Okay. So without any criticism of Marie Kondo or anybody who ascribes to it, um, You are nowhere near hoarding or overwhelmed if you can even entertain the possibility of following um, Marie Kondo's method. Um, And if it works for you and it is not claiming your life um, or time, energy, and focus, it is uh, then that's fine. If it is not feeding any uh, tendency or exacerbating any tendency you have toward perfectionism or rituals. Um, that's good too. Um, but there, I would say the vast majority of people, um, are on a scale, on a continuum of vulnerability where, um, it can become, um, a ritual. And there aren't many people who have the luxury in in the real world. There are not that many people who have the luxury of stopping and organizing their whole life um, in one fell swoop by just not starting in one area and taking baby steps, but actually turning around the whole environment 
in one fell swoop, do the whole thing um, is part of that adage. That's not realistic. All right. That is not realistic. And um, just thank your lucky stars and know how simple and manageable and privileged you are. If your life allows you that much focus and steam that you can a get there and stay there. Let me tell you a little story. Um, so I went, I got a call from uh, somebody who was becoming a new client. She couldn't be released from the hospital after falling and really severely breaking her ankle. Um, she was in uh, aftercare, but they wouldn't release her to her home because of the condition of it. And so she said, you know, I can't afford this. I need to get home. Is there any way? So I went and met her because I don't clean houses and I don't turn environments around. If it's going to rehappen right away because you don't have the skills or you don't have the understanding of how it happened in the first place. These people don't need another experience of defeat. Okay, and failure. So I'm not setting you up for that. So we had a talk, uh, a few talks, and I decided, yeah, okay, that was going to happen here. And so in going through, it was a very chaotic environment when we got there. She couldn't be there. Um, and I said, okay, I want some ground rules, though. For instance, uh, when we come across things um, that what are what are the criteria for keeps and goes and um, with paper, paper can be an extra challenge. So what I will do with your permission is kind of organize it in some way, um, but I'm going to be leaving the paper and we will do that together after because that can get complicated. But we may need to put things away as we discover them, right? Um, and so we defined the kinds of things in the areas of the house where things should just go. Or, and what the list was. And so when I got to her bedroom, it was clearly a place she had used as a refuge. Um, and because the broken ankle wasn't the only thing that had gone wrong in her life over the last three years. And um, so she said, Elaine, if you're there, I trust you. You can open my drawers, you can do whatever. You and I are going to work together. You're my therapist. There's nothing I will keep from you, okay? And so if you need to open a drawer, then you can do that. Now, I want you to picture um, a two-bedroom, basically ground floor condo, um, highly accumulated, all right? Um, we got into the bedroom, and I think we've got jewelry, and we're going to put it away and that kind of thing. And, you know, not fabulous jewelry. This is not a really wealthy person. And I open the drawer, and I think, huh? And I look around, and the first thing, it's an underwear drawer, a panty drawer. And everything is rolled, and it is filed in color coding and of course the first thing I thought to myself was how much time did this take like do you have that much time and energy if you had that much time and energy you probably would have devoted it to a lot of other things that were more important than your panties and so I thought as a therapist, I always remark and follow up on things that stand out as unusual or things in a situation that you would expect that are missing are, and what the meaning for you is. So the next time I saw her, I said, you know, something interesting happened and I just want to kind of get your perspective on it. So your panty drawer, she looked and she said, yeah, she said, um, I started to follow the Marie Kondo method and I didn't know who Marie Kondo was at that point. And I said, okay. And she said, I didn't get too far because I was already overwhelmed and the philosophy of it was what I wanted. But what I found was finding joy in things and keeping the things that give you joy when you're really overwhelmed or confused or everything gives you joy. 
it became like, this gives me joy, that gives me joy, this gives me joy. She said, I was lost. And so she said, um, I could do it in the panty drawer, but I have a book by every person who ever philosophized on decluttering or organizing or whatever. It is not about cleaning up. It is not about organizing. It is not even about the clutter. It's about your relationship to yourself and your relationship to your things. Okay, there is no trick. There is no system. You need to respect yourself first and get help that will respect you, not try to teach you a formula. Okay, you have your own competencies. You just can't grasp them right now because other things are interfering. The debris that has to be cleared away is the debris in your life, in your mind, in your thinking, in your relationships, that you can't find yourself in this environment. It doesn't represent you. It represents a state of mind that you have been in long enough to create this clutter. And it doesn't have to take a long time. That's why I wrote the book, um, is it respects you. You can find yourself. It's got 27 um, as tools and strategies in the book. And Johns Hopkins has asked us to write a therapist guide as well. And we will be doing that. Um, but on the Johns Hopkins website, they were kind enough to, to post about 47 other tools and resources that we couldn't put in the book because it would have been too big to be affordable by the average person. But I want you to have them. Because the things you need, the combination for you might be on the Johns Hopkins website in addition to the information that's in the book. Wonderful. I'm going to make sure I post that link as well. I really love uh, how you responded to that question, Elaine. I think it's very personal and I feel like you have a real heart and affection for people that are suffering from this. And I think that's very much coming across. So I can't endorse this enough if you're somebody suffering. Now, here's another thing that I think is going to come up. So who listens to this show? A bunch of therapists listen to this show, people that are interested in psychology. So I love that you just said this. We're making a therapist guide. So I think for therapists who are running into this in their practices or who are interested in helping this, uh, I think, underserved community, um, I think right here, if you're, if you're a therapist out there looking for a niche, this is a niche to help. Uh, but we have to become an expert on the niche before you we can help. You have to be informed. You have to be informed. You have to be informed. informed. You have to be Onboarding. An e yes. Onboarding. Yeah. Education. So what I would say is, you know, let's start with Elaine's book. Also read research. And then the therapist guy is going to be coming out because this is a very, as I said, like, I, I don't think I've met a therapist besides you that is an expert on this. So this is a very underserved community. And Elaine and I were talking before I started recording about how a lot of people, um, like you said, this number is low because these are only the, the reported cases. So how much is unreported and how many people are struggling but feel too shameful to speak up? So another audience that I'm thinking about will probably be listening to this because of the title is going to have something with the word hoarding in it, it are family members. Family members and friends and, um, you know, uh, people in intimate relationships with people that have hoarding troubles. Um, what would you say maybe to, to help the family members of people or, or close friends of people that are, how do, how do we approach the person who's having the difficulty? So one of the things that I included in the book, and I'm just trying to find it here because there are too um, numerous to remember right off the top of my head. Oh, of course are the do's and don'ts. Families, therapists, anybody who is even remotely considering uh, putting their hands on anybody else's life um, in their environment. One of the things that I have discovered because I've tried it both ways is um, you read to be effective, you really need to work in the environment with the person. 
and you need to know what the risks are there. You also need to know a lot about, you don't need to be an expert, but you need to know a lot about the comorbidities that are associated. And then here are some do's and don'ts. There are 12 do's and don'ts, okay? Remember, the most important thing people hoarding need to do is change their relationship to their things. Use the strategies in chapter four. The process of decluttering usually happens more easily. Acknowledge the accumulation, but don't make it the focus at the beginning. Second, make the people your focus. Ask them how they're feeling uh, about having someone in their home. That can be very threatening and shaming. About you specifically being there. Life in general. And only then how things got to this point. Don't mention mess. Don't mention clutter. Don't mention hoarding. All right. Use whatever term they use for what they do. They may never use the term hoarder. That's perfectly fine. There's nothing gained by applying labels. The other thing as well is if they use a term that is disparaging or self-minimizing, delegitimizing, do not be quiet because silence is a scent. One of the things I say when people do that is, I can't accept that, I'm sorry, because I know that people do things for good reasons, sometimes when those reasons are unknown to them. So if you're doing this, you're doing it for a good reason. It's not working for you, but let's find out what that is and make it work for you. Okay, number four, don't confront denial until you have a solid, positive relationship. Five, language is powerful. Be aware of your personal standards and feelings about clutter, dirt, and deteriorated environments. Check yourself for possible blaming inferences. No one is at fault. Six, working in hoarding situations with someone who is anxious and reluctant is frequently tiring and frustrating. Scan yourself for fatigue and burnout. Pace yourself accordingly. Remember, do one 15-minute work period followed by only one more 15-minute work period, and only if you can commit to the complete second 15 minutes, because that helps learn a, teach a person how to learn to self-regulate. Otherwise, stop and take a break. Seven, we are entitled to our own thoughts, values, and opinions. We as therapists or helpers, as family, even loved ones, are not entitled to apply them to others who come to us for help. People have the right to live the way they choose, according to their own standards and values. Occasionally, there are consequences for this choice. We cannot make others do things differently to save them from the right to learn through consequences. We are wisest and most helpful when we are aware of our own prejudices and judgmental internal dialogue. I encourage everyone to consciously repeat to themselves, as I sometimes must myself, my personal preferences stop at the door. If we fail to do so, we put ourselves at risk of unexpected slips of the tongue, which are demonstrated in our facial expressions tones of voice and other body language we will make the other an adversary not an ally as we work together eight don't barrage people with questions ask what you need to know most one question at a time slowly and gently watch your tone of voice give people time to reflect and reply in their own way Treat every person who hoards as you would want someone you love to be treated. This principle works for the full range of work necessary in hoarding situations from simple to serious. 
Sometimes we feel the pressure to make fast and extensive headway decluttering. These are our feelings and priorities. It's best not to pass them on to other people. They have their own pressures, priorities, and pace. Nine, don't be the expert. Don't let anyone cast you in the role of expert. You are the guide, advocate, and coach. The accomplishments and progress belong to the person whose stuff you're working with, not you as the coach. Ten, don't promise things you can't do. Focus on what you can do. Ask what they most need help with. Even if you can help with only a small segment of one of their needs, that is honest progress. Trust will develop from there. 11, don't bluff. Say what you mean and mean what you say, gently and with respect. If you aren't sure, say so. Check your facts when you aren't sure and get back to them. Last, don't try to buy a relationship with the person hoarding by privately taking sides against enforcement officials or anyone else. Even if your personal opinion about the requirements of the authority figure is not positive, work to build understanding between all parties. With your support, people who hoard need to follow the same rules and laws as everyone else. They are part of society and special rules do not apply to them. Be aware, however, that with hoarding disorder now in the DSM-5, hoarding can qualify as a disability and they may have legitimate rights to reasonable accommodation under human rights legislation. I think this is a very wonderful gift that you're providing the world, Elaine. And I was just thinking about your whole do's and don'ts. If I could just, you know, not only does this apply to hoarding, but we could just put take out the word hoard or hoarding situation and put in any situation that's difficult. So I think that's very well written. And I'm so glad that you shared that with us. Um, I'm very inspired by this. Uh, I'm definitely going to read the rest of the book because, you know, things have been a little crazy, but I'm, I'm excited <laughs> to finish it. And it's so far so good. And um, uh, yeah, I, I'm excited. So I want to make sure that everyone knows all this will be in the notes. There'll be links to get connected with Elaine's uh, materials and her podcast and, um, you know, all of the things, John, uh, it looks like you have a good relationship with John Hopkins yeah, University, wonderful. which is wonderful. wonderful. I Very love Very privileged to Yes. That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Big fan. Yeah. Um, you know, so they've been doing great with so many health projects in the U.S. Uh, so I've been a huge fan of that university for a long time. Uh, so, uh, and so, yeah, I'm just, I feel privileged to interview you, Elaine, and I'm so glad you're providing all of this. Is there any... Uh, anything that I missed that you wanted to make sure people have a resource on or anything towards the end here? Um, I, Sue and I also blog with Psychology Today, and I do distance counseling. If you don't have appropriate uh, resources in your community, um, then I do distance counseling as far away as Germany and Hong Kong. So um, if that is an option for you. Uh, first, look in your community, though. Um, and if you can't find it, um, then please feel free to uh, email me at elaine.birchall at hoarding.ca. And we'll see if we can't either find you resources closer to home or if all else fails, I get you started by working together through Zoom or Skype or some other platform. I love it. Well, thank you so much for making yourself available and all this wonderful material. And I've learned a lot. As I said, I started the show not knowing that much about hoarding, and I feel like I've learned a lot. So I'm going to definitely learn more over the summer as I catch up on my my reading list now that I'm semi-quarantined here. Uh, Great, so. and now you're a resource. <laughs> I, yes, I, well, I'm now, I now know who to go to. And uh, yeah, this will be going up on our website. And I'm going to keep your materials right here in my office so that I can make sure I, I hand, uh, hand your information off as appropriate. So lovely. Thanks so much for sharing part of your Thank day. You, Paul. Thank you for the invitation. It was great. Oh, yes, my pleasure. And uh, thanks so much, Elaine. You're welcome. Bye now.
And there you have it. This has been another episode of the Intentional Clinician Podcast. If you are enjoying this show, please share it with people you know. I would surely appreciate it. And if you have not subscribed or left us a rating on iTunes, please go hit the subscribe button or leave us a rating. It would really help me out a lot. Until next time on The Intentional Clinician, I'm wishing you all a safe and peaceful week. If you are looking for an Emdria consultant, I am still an Emdria consultant in training. A little bit of a delay due to the current world situation of the pandemic, but you can check out more details at the counselingsupervisorgr.com website or healthforlifegr.com. The recording you just listened to consists of the personal opinions of Paul Krauss and his guest, and while these are based upon the literature they have read and their experience in their respective fields, this information should not be viewed as a definitive opinion on any subject. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for treatment. If you are in a crisis, please dial 911 or the National Suicide Prevention Line at 1-800-273-8255. Are you a young person of color? Are you feeling down, stressed, and overwhelmed? If so, please text the word STEVE to 741741. That's S-T-E-V-E to 741741, and a live crisis counselor will respond. If you are in need of counseling, please do not hesitate to make an appointment with a local licensed professional counselor in your area. You can also make an appointment with the excellent clinicians in the Grand Rapids, Michigan area at Health for Life Grand Rapids and the Trauma-Informed Counseling Center of Grand Rapids by visiting www.healthforlifegr.com. Now we are serving the entire state of Michigan thanks to online therapy. Stay tuned for more details. Thanks so much for listening. It's a dangerous game, it's a very fine line, and if one step is wrong, I'll have no cards to play, and that's why I've got nothing to say.